How, how, hello, everyone, and welcome to another Pulse Pounding episode of In the Studio with Brad. Uh, got some, some fun stuff for you this week, or at least I hope it's fun. First off, if you recall last week, I did a run through from sketch from the sketch form to more or less final inks for a piece for for the upcoming X crawl game. For those of you who are just tuning in, this is approximately I couldn't find the actual paper, so I had to print out some sketch the sketch. This is what I usually submit to the art director. As you can see, it's just you know, fairly loosely done in pencil. Then I usually send that to him. And if he doesn't have any changes that he wants, I then take it to, this is what you probably are, saw last week. However, there's a little bit more to it because I like to take <clears throat> X-Crawl and give it a real pop culture sheen to it. So, this is what I did. I added a bunch of shading and some kind of fake zipatone effects. For those of you who don't know what zipatone is, it used to be an old type of use of a uh, acetate paper that they would use to tone stuff, and it would literally be a clear sheet of plastic with ink on the back. And it would have these tiny little black dots printed on the front. And what you would do is literally you would kind of guesstimate how much it was, cut out a rough piece of the zipatone, put it right there on the paper, and then very carefully with a, an X-Acto knife, you would cut the shape of where you wanted the zipatone to be and then remove the rest of the acetone. And it would end up with, in this case, it would have been like a bunch of vertical black lines, but they did this for everything. Uh, if you see any comic books older than about 25 years or so, or so you'll notice all the colors were actually made by putting little dots of color. And that was, again, the same thing as the Zipatone, only just in different colors. So there we go. From sketch to this is what it will look like when it's printed. Now, I did all this actually on the computer. I cheated because Zipatone is very expensive anymore. And you can basically do everything you want to it with Zipatone in Photoshop for, <clears throat> for nothing. Then I threw a couple flare effects in, yada, 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 and done. So that's that. Now here's something else you probably won't see a whole lot of because I am mostly a black and white guy. But Goodman Games plans this coming year to release a book called Dungeon Denizens, which is going to be a 500 page source book for D&D 5th edition, and it's going to be a monster page. So it's going to be 500 different monsters, including, here we go, can you, here, hold on, I'm, I'm trying to angle this for the best view. I guess this is called a gas bag. It's uh, basically a walking grenade. I guess when it uh, detects an enemy, it runs right up to them on these vine-like legs, and then it explodes. Kind of a uh, environmentally friendly hand grenade. Now, those of you who play Dungeon Crawl Classics will probably kind of recognize this fellow. This is a child of, okay, somebody help me here. Boggle B, Boggu something like that. The one, the frog patron. Anyhow, 
is an evil looking frog and he's big. This fellow is an interesting take on the concept of the animated skeleton, except that out of instead of a single skeleton, it basically animates itself out of a pile of skeletons and then just forms the body out of whatever parts are available. Hence the fact that it has two pelvic bones, three pelvic bones, four skulls, a whole lot of ribs. You know, a couple of things I had to, to skip on. I was not even going to try to paint the phalanges in a finger or a yeah, forget it. You know, I may be obsessive. I'm not that obsessive. And finally, I guess this this is a white warg. And it is basically an undead wolf that I guess some of its the other undead in the book use as steeds, kind of like the wargs from Lord of the Rings. This is your this is the basic sketch that I sent to the art director that he approved of approved. And this is approximately how it's going to look in the book. This piece is not done yet in case you can't tell. Ooh, like so. Uh, sorry about that, folks. I was so busy showing off my work, I was was forgetting to show off my work. Uh, once I get done here tonight, I'll probably go back in, do the rest of the fur. The pink spots, of course, are where the fur has just kind of peeled away. So I'll make that look nice and gr gross and grisly. It's got some intestines hanging down because, hey, it's a zombie wolf. You know, all the normal stuff. And only in my life would drawing wolf, zombie wolf intestines be considered the normal stuff. So what are we working on in the studio today? This is another piece for x -Curl. And I believe it is supposedly set in Detroit. That's not super important, but it does add one minor detail. And it basically is a bunch of zombies that the player characters have come down to this level on an elevator and the elevator doors open and the zombies are standing there ready to attack them. You know, so, you know, yeah. Typical elevators in Detroit. So I'm going to start by doing some of the easy, straightforward stuff. Now, what I usually do, and you'll notice, I actually have the box kind of drawn, but I'm overdrawing from where I would where I will do it because that way if for some reason my construction lines are off it still works just a second we've got a little sign here Oop, now, but I'm sorry. We've been trying to avoid, we were trying to avoid that this week and obviously, okay. One thing you can always tell with X crawl and some other more, I would call real reality oriented games, you do a lot more actual straightforward line work. And what I mean like that is like, and I'll use this. If I were just doing like a fantasy wall or a fantasy doorway, you know, it's kind of irregular because it's maybe stone or carved out of wood. You know, it doesn't have to be absolutely crisp, you know, but if this is a manufactured door, 
you want to get that hard, straight, almost industrial line, if that makes any sense. So. Do, do, do. There we go. Rolling rulers are really a wonderful tool to use for doing a lot of, of really crisp line work. Come on, there we go. Let's face it, everybody, if you're going to tell, you know, let people know that they're getting off it from an elevator, you want to have things like the elevator buttons. Okay, let's see. Do I have, yes. Looking for my circle template. Any artist will tell you when you start equipping your studio, you get rulers and you get all sorts of different circle templates. For those of you who have not seen these things before, they allow you to draw accurately circles up from 1 16th of an inch in diameter, like here, to one and a half inches. Because even though it sounds like it shouldn't be that hard, actually drawing a circle is a major, major pain in the tuchus. So there we go. And voila, we have a call button. Get this line here, oops, sorry. And zone tight. Okay. Um, one nice thing is if you flip this over, there is actually a ridge on the underside of the circle template so that the plastic is not of the inside holes is not actually resting on the paper. There's like a uh, maybe a 64th of an inch, but that's enough to keep from any bleeding. Here, you can do it. Hold on. Do, 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 do. And this is just a normal pen, but there you go. Yeah. Pen allowance on all holes is 0 0.04. Yeah. They calculate in when they are manufacturing it that it's going to, there's going to be some difficulty there. And actually the uh, top of the hole is wider than the bottom of the hole. So they actually have that, cal they, they literally calculate that in sometimes. Now it depends on how much, how much you're spending on the circle template. Like if you go and buy your art supplies, it's a Dollar Tree, good luck. You know, you kind of get what you get. These are a little bit more expensive, like this rolling ruler here that I'm using. If I remember correctly, it was like $12. And like this circle template, I think this was six or seven dollars for basically just a molded piece of plastic. Okay, let's see. Let's keep the up in the frame. Oh, by the way, any artist will tell you that outside the frame is fair game for any notes you need to take. And I do mean any notes. Uh, when my one old boss, you know, said, hey, I'm having to change 
my phone number because somebody hacked my account. Um, you know, so she just like, this is my new phone number. So I didn't have anything else. So I just scribbled it right out. You know, and about three years later, I'm at Gen Con try, trying to sell the piece and I realized, oh, great. I should probably scribble up Miranda's phone number from the margin of the pictures before I sell this, shouldn't I? Oop. There we go. Get that nice industrial chipped pink look. Do, 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 do. Okay, good. Now, just like the X crawl piece that I showed a little while ago, I will probably work this over in Photoshop. So like, I might like leave this basically white, but I'll probably make the area these areas where it looks like the paint has chipped away, I'll probably make those like a 30% gray. Hold on, I've got dig, 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 dig. Let's see, is this the pen I like? Yes. Can you, yeah, okay, you can still see me here. little bit of scratch. I'll probably add a little bit of graffiti here, you know, and that's the kind of stuff I just kind of wing it when I in Photoshop, just so I have something to do other than simply just follow my own guidelines. You kind of want to hit a this fine balance between making the picture finished at the very beginning, and at the same time, leaving yourself some room to be creative. There we go. So I might add some stupid little, like Joe was here, or I don't know. But this is usually a good time to put like for a good time, call 555 and, you know, the phone number of somebody you don't, the last four digits of the phone number of somebody you don't like, you know, stuff like that. There we go. Okay, just to give a little bit of three dimensionality, I'm going to add a little bit of a line here and a bit of a line over here. Now you'll probably notice that the circle, the call center didn't really does extend out past the margin or however you want to phrase it. That's just because it's almost easier just to go ahead and do that than trying to remember, you know, oh, I don't need to finish that part. You know, when it's something like that, just do the whole template and boom. There we go. All right, now on to the fun stuff. Okay, so we got a zombie wearing a Halloween mask. Come on, where am I? Where am I? Hold on. Okay, sorry. Oops, sorry. Now my challenge here, I think is going to make it obvious that the zombies are wearing masks. That's kind of a, oh. So who came up with the idea for uh, zombies wearing masks? That I would assume would be Monsieur 
Brendan LaSalle, the mad genius behind XCrawl in general. And there is actually a reason in the universe why zombies all are made to wear masks. Because what happens is the people who run the dungeons, well, they'll go to the different local necromancers guilds and buy bodies to be turned into zombies for the for this or that x crawl well people started calling in and complaining to these shows when they would get aired on pay-per-view because they really weren't too happy to see grandma that they said goodbye to last week and we were all so sad and she's She's, she's trying to kill Joe the X-Crawler. So what they did, because they were getting all sorts of uh, lawsuits of people, you know, claiming emotional distress. So they made them start wearing masks. Usually in the X-Crawl universe, the masks are smiley faces. These are kind of special zombies, I guess, called purge zombies, and they're a little bit more intelligent. But for some reason, they prefer to, to choose which masks they wear. So, okay, here we go. Okay. There we go, that should help tell people that, that this is just a mask. So yeah, I'm not quite sure where the uh, line between normal zombies and these zombies do because I guess they're intelligent and have some magical abilities, which seems kind of rude and unfriendly to me. I'm an old school kind of guy. I like my zombies to give you to mostly be wandering around in, uh, you know, farmland in the fields outside of uh, Willard, Ohio. Here's an amusing detail for you. So I had never actually seen the original, like 1968, Night of the Living Dead. Okay. This is when I'm still in college and I'm still dependent on my parents to get me to and fro from rural. Eastern Ohio back to Bowling Green State University, which is in Northwest Ohio, okay? So one of the towns that I know we went, we would always drive through was a little town called Willard, Ohio. Yeah, okay, well, that's nice, whatever, you know. Well, one night while I'm home, original night of the day comes on. It's like, yeah, what the heck? I got nothing better better to do right now. It's Christmas break, you know? So I start watching. And that's when I find out that the set of the original Night of the Living Dead is a farmhouse outside of Willard, Ohio. And it was very strange because when the original Night of the Living Dead was made, they were still allowed to use actual phone numbers and such you know, on TV shows. So they're running this crawl of, in case you need, a, if you need emergency help, and I'm looking at those, it's like, um, that phone number is the phone number for the one hospital in Youngstown, Ohio, that I was almost born at. It was kind of disturbing. But yeah, so I just, when the movie was over, I just went out to my dad and said, okay, just to clarify that things, if when you're driving me back to school, if we see any hitchhikers just kind of stumbling along the side of the road, you know, and they've got you know, blood all down their face. We're not stopping to pick them up or anything. We're just keeping on going. Thanks, Dad. Then I found out later on that they basically chose Willard, Ohio 
essentially out of a hat because the film movie was of course made in over in Pennsylvania. But yeah, I just thought that was incredibly funny that this small Ohio town that they listed was one that I was pretty bloody familiar with. There we go. So what I will do to give a kind of a plasticky sheen, once I scan this, you see these areas where I'm doing like the little black like this. I will try and convert those. I'll make the entire head maybe 20% yeah, black, but then I'll make take those areas and I'll isolate them and I'll make them like a hard white. You know, so it doesn't it doesn't look so much like just normal skin. Okay, there we go. Let me see, how am I doing this? Okay, so that's that. And because this is a zombie after all, we got to have a couple lesions. Okay, I'm gonna work on this finger, this hand for a few moments here, folks. Sorry. Okay, and because he is a zombie after all, yes, he's missing a finger. Just because, hey, he's a zombie, you know? No real good reason, but... You know, you gotta do something to show that he's not just got, you know, a strange skin condition or something. There we go. Sorry. There we go. Do some knuckle details here. Maybe a little bit of a vascularity across the back of the hand. There we go. You know what? I think this guy's going to lose part of a finger. Yep, say goodbye to part of a finger. I don't normally just sit here and just talk to myself when I'm doing this, by the way. You know, I mean, all artists are, are crazy to some degree, but, you know. There we go. Now. Do, 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 do. Remember how I said these, these zombies have magical powers? I guess one of their powers is that they can cause things to burst into flame. Now, luckily, I'm guessing from what little I've had to, to read about this, they can't just make their opponents burst into flames, and that wouldn't be very fun anyhow. But they can make their weapons burst into flame. All of these guys are equipped with huge knives, so that just makes things that much more fun for the X crawlers because, hey, why not? Hey, why settle for slightly overpowered zombies when you can have slightly overpowered zombies with magic weapons? Makes perfect sense to me. What do you think? Okay, there we go. Oops, sorry. It's 
So we plan on doing 10 episodes of this and hopefully by the time we get to episode 10, I will remember to make sure that the art stays where the camera can see it and to keep my head out of the out of the camera frame, but you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna make any bets here, kids. There we go. And because they are zombies, you know, they don't, they're, they're not big on, uh, you know, keep for the, their equipment, you know. So let's make this, these arm guards, maybe a little bit better looking, you know. Now if this were a normal X crawl character, their arm guards would be covered with logos from the different companies. But I don't know, maybe uh, no one really wants to have be known for helping sponsor a bunch of zombies. Except maybe the local Necromancers Guild, maybe a funeral part, local funeral home. I don't know. I guess so there would be some people. But in general, you know, I don't think I don't think your average burger joint is really going to be like hey, we want it so that the first thing people remember about our food is zombies. Not the best advertising campaign, I think. There we go, whoops. There we go. Do, do, do. do a little bit of line work in here to suggest the in, inner parts of the sleeve. There we go. A little bit of a muscle tissue showing through there. Why? Because why not? Okay, now, hold on. I think this guy's got, this guy is under control for the moment. So let's work on zomb the zombie wearing the Michael Myers from Halloween mask. I probably should have had one of them wearing a hockey mask, shouldn't I? And yes, that is a an Uncle Sam zombie in the background wearing the uh, top hat with the stars and stripes on it. I don't know whether you can see that or not. There we go. Can you see that or not, folks? Well, hopefully you'll be able to see better by the end of the hour. The biggest problem with doing a lot of natural phenomena like water and fire is it's so very random appearing that you can't just go like, okay, I'm gonna draw some fire and go drink, drink. I mean, you, it's one of those things that is very much easier almost just to photo reference, even if you're just using the, imagery as inspiration for what you're drawing. I've done that more than once. You know, I might have to draw some fire and I'm not doing it for this one because it's kind of a, I'm, 
kind of under the gun to try and get this piece done as fast as possible. But if I were trying to paint this maybe, I would actually download some pictures of fire. And actually I, I have a folder on my computer that is just marked photo reference. And I've got like eight or nine different pictures of fire that I can just, you know, grab and download to use as inspiration for the artwork at any one time. Did a water uh, foliage for trees. You know, these all can provide a real challenge for an artist. There are some things you can fake, but quite often people can tell that you're faking it basically. <laughs> One interesting thing that I have noticed over the years is that a lot of artists basically have this huge mental database of imagery that we can call on sometimes pretty much at will. And I know that I've done stuff that even confused some of my art teachers. It's like, how can you do this from memory? And I'm like, I don't know, I can. I mean, you think if you think about it, you know that your you know your average comic book artist does not have somebody standing in their studio posing for them all the time. So they have to get very much used to, okay, I'm just gonna kind of wing this, Im this, this image. And that's what I quite often end up having to do. So uh, just because you can't see chat from where you are, um, this okay. episode has spurred a lot of zombie puns in the chat. <laughs> Okay. And, uh, I just wanted to highlight some of my favorites that have happened. Um, okay. One of them is the next great workout tape is Buns of Rotten Flesh. Oh. <laughs> We've got uh, Brain Burgers and um, what was the other one? Uh, Zomburgers. So, Zomburgers? Uh, Zomburgers. These are okay, great. hold on. I got to make a note of that. Z O M. Burgers. Mm. No, oh, hold on. That's got to be with a Z at the end, too. Zomburgers. Yum, yum. I always I always uh make jokes because for better or worse I seem to have a real skill for do, doing zombies. Um, you know, I mean, I've actually had people hire me specifically for jobs based on the fact that I can draw zombies so well. You know, so I always make a joke out of joke about it. it's like why do people you know and then i will usually post something truly horrific and you know from my zombie oeuvre why do people keep hiring me to do zo draw zombies jeez it's one of those things if i uh had to do all this over again i probably would have contacted george romero when i was like 20 and tried to join his special effects team Joan also reminded me that earlier we had uh, a discussion of what a group of zombies would be called, and uh, we've kind of come to the consensus that uh, they're like crows. It's a murder of zombies. Mm. I think a Romero of zombies sounds better to me, personally. <laughs> Romero like I said, zombies, I'm, yep. you know.
Yeah, they didn't actually plan on doing anything major when they did that first movie. They just, they were, he and his partner were, were doing educational films of the sort that we probably all remember from high school. And they wanted to kind of branch off and start doing stuff that they could actually make money with and not be, you know, bored out of their skull. And they knew that there was a market for, you know, cheesy horror movies. So they came up with the idea of like, let me see, how can we do this cheap? Okay, if we don't have to really spend a ton of money on makeup, maybe if we can do like, hey, what about like, like making like them all like zombies and such? Because then we can just, you know, slap some makeup around their eyes and some chocolate syrup around their mouths and ta-da, they're zombies, you know. But yeah, they weren't trying to do anything major. They were just trying to get out of the rut of doing, you know, this is why you should obey the speed limit, Timmy, type movies. I mean, let's face it, if you had a choice between making a movie about zombies and another movie about, you know, this is, your school lunch is very important for you for you as a growing, you know, growing child. So always remember to eat your school lunch. Which would you prefer to do? I personally think that after about, oh, three movies like that, I'd probably be ready to start making zombie movies too. <sighs> Oh, here's another interesting little tidbit for you. Um, anyone who's seen the original Night of the Living Dead, and I assume a lot of the people who are tuning in here have at some point, they received great praise because they cast a Black man as Ben, the protagonist. You know, and people thought they're being so progressive and they, they really broke a barrier and the simple fact was they wanted to hire a professional actor to be the lead and Dwayne Jones I believe his name was was the only actor they could get their hands on and you know the fact that he was black was just I wouldn't call it a coincidence but it was not to my knowledge a conscious choice on their part. He was just the person that their budget could afford. So. By the way, my wife has actually uh, had a chance to hang out with Ken Foray, the actor that played in, I believe all three of the original uh, Romero Dead movies. He was at a convention in Toledo many years ago. And so I'm out with my portfolio and you know trying to wrestle up any kind of business that I can, which unfortunately wasn't saying a whole lot, but hey, you got to try it at least, you know? And I come back to the booth and Jess is gone and she's down about three booths down, splitting what? An orange with uh, Ken Foray. Turns out he's actually, he was actually fairly local to the convention. So it was easy to get him. Oh, okay, come on folks. Oops, sorry. There we go. Yes, this is probably, I know this is probably making some of you, you in the audience kind of like, would you hold that piece of paper still for like one minute? 
Unfortunately, unfortunately, this is how I draw. And the funny thing is there's a, I had an incident several years ago where I dislocated this thumb and badly. Never, we never did figure out why it got dislocated, but it's like, okay, well, you know, I mean, is my hand, my drawing hand's free, you know, and this won't be any problem, right? Yeah, right. I did not until that day realize exactly how dependent I was on being able to use this hand to move things around while I'm drawing. It was just one of those things that you just do and you don't realize it until you can't do it. Okay, come on kids, there we go. Another bit of shading there. Actually, I think I am going to do, there we go, sorry. There we go. Okay, hold on just a second. Just got to, got to gather my thoughts for a moment, folks. Okay, so this is 87. Half of 87 is 43, I want to say. Close enough. I'm going to do one of the easier parts of the job. The elevator buttons, though I'm not, I'm, I will just typeset the buttons when I'm done, but I want to give the, there we go. It's tight. Okay, 42, so 21. I mean, you don't have to be absolutely exact on these, these things, but it helps to be you know, fairly close. There we go. Get out the handy dandy rolling ruler. And I want to make this kind of a square, so close enough to be a square. Oh. There we go. So we've got the basics of our elevator pad. Maybe just do some textural kind of like Okay, this one looks like it's broken a bit. So I guess it kind of makes sense if you're going to have a uh, short term dungeon that, you know, people are going to be fighting each other in, you really don't want to worry about having the absolute best facilities. So they will sometimes convert old warehouses, 
you know, mall, you know, malls that have gone out of business to be the sites of X crawls. And that's why I sometimes add all the sorts of graffiti and like where the ink is, the paint is chipping away. You know, they're not going to worry about this. That you know, as soon as this X crawls over, it goes back up to for on as a rental. Assume after they, you know, clean up the blood and such. You know, that'd be very rude to, uh, you know, rent someone to someone like, oh, you know, sorry. Uh, by the way, there's a dragon's uh, body, you know, on the fifth floor. Um, we didn't bother cleaning it up, so I'm afraid that's up to you. But we'll what, deduct the uh, cost of the cleaning supplies from your first month's rent? I still wouldn't be too happy. How about you? I actually mentioned uh, when I found out that we we're going to be doing X Detroit, we need to make some sort of reference to this place up in Detroit called King's Books. And I kid you not, it's an old. Um, office building like five stories and at some point it, the it went out of business so somebody bought it and converted it into a used bookstore a five story used bookstore i've only actually ever actually been to king's books once because i have a feeling i would basically probably end up bankrupting myself in a you know before if i let myself start shopping there for very much. There's just some things you just don't want to do. There we go. Now, these zombies, I get, and I guess they are officially known as purge zombies, if I didn't mention that before, are more intelligent than your typical, you know, bought in bulk from the local necromancers guild. And yes, they actually know to wear armor in a fight. But I figure they're probably not too concerned, again, with upkeep. So while they're wearing, they are wearing armor, it's not in the best shape anymore. You know, hence all the little nicks and cuts and such. I think. Here we go. A little bit of cool shading there. And again, if this were a normal set of x crawl armor, it would be covered with all sorts of logos. Oh. <clears throat> I suppose you really wouldn't want to uh, To be sponsoring a team of zombie warriors, even if you were, say, like, you know, the local funeral parlor, because nobody really wants to uh, have their, lo their loved ones uh, take the their loved ones off somewhere and then find out that maybe they are selling them on the part, on the side, you know. Gee, this coffin feels awfully light when we're carrying it out to the hearse. Oh, never mind that. Not good public relations, guys. I hate to tell you. There we go. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Oh, good lord. Okay, so. There we go, folks. Time flies when you're having fun or you're drawing zombies, I guess. So, hopefully you enjoyed your stay here and I hope that you will all come back next week. Uh, my wife has probably been adding this in chat, but if you put your name in, we will be having a drawing at the end of the season about, I think one, I want to say maybe six or seven weeks from now. And some lucky winner will get one of the pieces that I've worked on here, as in, yes, the actual originals, to hopefully show off to their friends. But regardless, I hope you have enjoyed your, this little glimpse into the creative process and you have enjoyed your glimpse of the upcoming products the Goodman Games will be putting, be putting out. Um, I don't really play fifth edition, but I can see where a book of 500 brand new monsters will be extremely useful. And if nothing else, they're fun to read, aren't they, folks? So, okay. And I believe that is it, kids. I shall talk to you next week. And between now and then, I will finish this piece and turn it. And we'll see what we work on next week. And you folks have a great week. <laughs>